Let me start by congratulating Amit Pawa and his entire team for a truly fantastic meeting. I've enjoyed every minute of it, even though I'm stuck here in Toronto, and I consider it a great honour to have been assigned the job of delivering the closing lecture. So, rebound pain after regional anaesthesia. Is it a thing? The dictionary definition of rebound is a recoil or abrupt recovery, usually off some sort of floor or limit. And there are indeed multiple studies that show precisely this rebound pattern in pain. So yes, it is very much a thing and a phenomenon that does exist. But a more important question is, what is rebound pain? I love this quote from Richard Feynman about what true learning and understanding represents. What's going on when patients experience this rebound in pain and what does it mean for their outcomes? Only if we can answer this can we determine how much it matters and what we should do about it. The definitions in the literature are not actually that helpful in my opinion. In our recent article in the Korean Journal of Anesthesiology, we propose instead this functional definition that rebound pain is a very specific phenomenon that describes acute postoperative pain which peaks abruptly following the resolution of effective regional anesthesia and is severe enough to have a clinically significant impact on patient well-being and function. I would, however, like to call your attention to this particular definition from the literature, which talks about a state of hyperalgesia. Now, this is not strictly accurate, at least not in the way that we anesthesiologists understand hyperalgesia. Rebound pain is not pathological hyperalgesia. That is to say, there is no exaggeration of the usual physiological nociceptive response. In fact, transient hyperalgesia is a normal response to any injury and is something that is familiar to all of us. Stop and think about it the next time you have a bump or scrape. All the nerve endings at the actual site of injury have lower thresholds to electrical firing and in addition, local inflammatory response activates nociceptors in the surrounding tissues to produce secondary hyperalgesia, a phenomenon that we call peripheral sensitization. If anything, regional anesthesia may reduce pathological hyperalgesia by blocking the transmission of nociceptive impulses to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, thus inhibiting the development of central sensitization. And this may account for the fact that to date, there is no demonstrable association between rebound pain after regional anesthesia and persistent postoperative pain, and it may in fact reduce the risk of this. So if rebound pain is not an exaggerated pain stimulus, then what is it? What I believe it represents is an unmasking of postoperative pain in the absence of adequate systemic analgesia. What I hope you just experienced there was a cognitive bias called contrast-based perception. And this can also be illustrated by the simple experiment in which you place one hand in a bucket of hot water and another in a bucket of cold water, and then after a time, place both into room temperature water. One will feel hot and the other will feel cold. But note that there is no actual thermal injury happening, rather there's an exaggerated perceptual response. This, I think, mirrors what is happening with rebound pain. Now, it's important to note that this observation does not invalidate the experience of rebound pain. Pain is, after all, a subjective phenomenon, but it emphasizes the fact that we are not necessarily causing physical harm to our patients with regional anesthesia. What is interesting and speaks further to the cognitive component of rebound pain is that patients appreciate regional anesthesia despite experiencing rebound pain. This Danish study conducted detailed interviews with patients having ankle fracture surgery under regional anesthesia alone. And all of them reported excruciating rebound pain when the block wore off. I don't really know what kind of transitional analgesia was prescribed, but they were all satisfied with having had the block and would readily have had it again. And a big part of this was that they were appreciative of the short-term benefits that the block offered. And I can actually speak to this myself, having had major shoulder surgery with a single-shot interscalene block. I appreciated the rapid emergence and recovery, 
the ability to go home the same day and not having to receive any intravenous opioid. A more recent RCT comparing regional and general anesthesia for distal radial fractures demonstrates this well. The general anesthesia group had a median pain score in the PACU of 6 out of 10, whereas the regional group was basically free of pain in the early postoperative period. Now, although it looks like the authors did not capture the point at which the block wore off, we see that at 24 hours, although the difference in pain intensity is statistically significant in favor of the GA group, the absolute pain is not terrible, and thereafter both groups do equally well. When we look at opiate consumption, however, this is where we see the benefit. Although there was a small bump up in opiate use on day one following discharge, it was small and opiate requirements were essentially similar thereafter, with the total amount over the first three days being significantly lower in the regional group. Finally, another outcome worth discussing is the impact that rebound pain might have on health care resource utilization. A small retrospective study from Vancouver suggested that patients who receive a brachial plexus block for wrist fracture surgery were more likely to seek medical attention for advice on postoperative pain. However, a much larger review of almost 60,000 patients having ambulatory shoulder surgery found no significant difference between those that got a block versus those that didn't in the instance of unplanned admissions or emergency room visits for acute pain. Does everybody get rebound pain? The obvious answer is no, because for one, it is surgery specific. The studies of rebound pain tend to involve shoulder, distal upper limb, or foot and ankle surgery. However, it's not just because these are associated with moderate to severe postoperative pain for at least 24 to 40 hours, although that's also an important factor. What is a bigger consideration in my opinion is that they are surgeries in which the regional anesthetic technique of choice is capable of completely eliminating all perioperative pain. Patients may thus receive little to no systemic analgesics until the block wears off, and when it does wear off, the contrast effect bias is maximized. If you look at something like lumbar spinal surgery, on the other hand, even though a technique like the erector spinae plane block works very well, it does not completely eliminate all of the pain. You can see from these RCTs that the block still significantly improves analgesia compared to no block at all, but because the patients wake up with some pain and start using some opioid almost immediately, there is no evidence of the sudden peak in pain intensity that is characteristic of a true rebound pain phenomenon. This also means that we should not feel too badly about imperfect or partial blocks. Giving your patient a little opioid now may actually mean a smoother time of it down the road. There may also be patient-specific risk factors, similar to those reported for subjective pain severity as a whole. For example, in a study of popliteal block for ankle fracture surgery, older patients had a much less marked increase in pain when the block wore off, peaking at only 2 out of 10, which probably wouldn't qualify as rebound pain. It's also interesting to note that all the patients had access to a PCA and received preemptive multimodal analgesia, and yet the younger group still exhibited this rebound peak of pain. And of course, an individual's psychological makeup will play a large part in the perception of pain severity and coping strategies. Fear of pain is a particularly robust predictor that is an influence even in relatively pain-tolerant individuals such as elite athletes. Now, having accepted that rebound pain is a very real phenomenon and one that has significant impact on patient well-being, the question is, what can we do about it? You heard me say that a major determinant of rebound pain is perceptual and cognitive. We can therefore address this with appropriate cognitive interventions. And this includes setting appropriate expectations on postoperative pain experiences, but doing so in a reassuring manner, rather than reinforcing any fear of pain to come. Patients also need to be counseled and educated about the phenomenon of rebound pain and the need for preemptive analgesia. This counseling and education should ideally take place ahead of the day of surgery and should be supplemented with some enduring material, either written or in this day and age, digital. 
Involving a family member or caregiver in the process is also very helpful if your patient agrees to it. Day surgery patients need to have an appropriate multimodal analgesic regimen prescribed for home use. And this last does involve some guesswork as the severity of the pain will often not become evident until they have left our care and are at home. Remember that regional anesthesia blocks the transmission of nociceptive inputs from the periphery to the spinal cord, but does nothing to reduce the inflammatory response at the site of injury or the development of peripheral sensitization. And here is where non-opioid analgesics, particularly anti-inflammatory drugs, have a key role, and they should be started earlier rather than later. The use of non-pharmacological therapies such as ice packs or cooling devices should also be encouraged. Another way to attenuate the impact of rebound pain is to try and better match block duration to the expected pain trajectory of the operation. Unfortunately, these trajectories remain poorly defined for the most part. And any effort to do so is also complicated by the fact that pain experience is subject to both cultural and geographical variation. Nevertheless, in most surgeries that are associated with moderate to severe pain, this intensity of pain usually lasts beyond 24 hours and maybe as long as 48 or even 72 hours before it starts to drop off. This 48 to 72 hour window may be the sweet spot in most surgeries. As an example, compare the pain profiles of these two studies of ankle fracture surgery. The one on the left comparing single shot popliteal tube block with no block at all, and the one on the right comparing single shot and continuous popliteal tube block for 48 hours. You can see that between 48 and 72 hours, the curves are starting to converge in both cases. The duration of single shot blocks can be prolonged quite effectively in most cases by the use of intravenous or perineural additives, particularly dexamethasone. And at least one study has also suggested that using multiple additives may perhaps have a synergistic effect. I'm still a big fan of catheters, however. The introduction of catheter over needle sets has simplified the insertion process considerably. The main advantage, however, is the flexibility that it offers. The infusion can be continued for up to several days, and this can even be done on an outpatient basis thanks to large capacity disposable pumps that are now available. Another advantage for, with inpatient catheters is that one can turn off the infusion to assess what the pain is like without the block and still reserve the option of restarting it should the pain be unbearable. All this must be weighed against the well-recognized disadvantages of catheter failures, relative complexity, cost, and the need for follow-up. And so they still remain somewhat contentious and subject to local policy and, I dare say, enthusiasm on the part of the practitioner. So in conclusion, rebound pain is a phenomenon that does indeed exist and is something that all of us who practice regional anesthesia must be aware of. Consider it a side effect of regional anesthesia, similar to the other side effects that we counsel patients about in general anesthesia. It's not something we see all of the time, but it occurs often enough and when it does, can cause significant distress to patients. Preoperative counseling and education together with appropriate systemic multimodal analgesic prescribing is the cornerstone of management. For those of you wishing to explore this further, please do refer to our recent review article that was published last year in the Korean Journal of Anesthesiology and is free to access. Thank you very much, and I'm now going to turn the floor over to our chair.